I shall recap a bit what we did, just for, for a short moment. And uh, this is a document that uh, I'm going to give to, uh, I mean, that will be given to you. Oh, did I give you the, the Mane diye hai na aapko? Oui. Oui. Because I made a short document just to give you uh, a few words about a uh, kind of summary of about mythology. Hmm? And after that you shall get a proper document uh, because last night you you so you 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 unfortunately you had to listen to me very late also and uh, i was to reconvert my ppp files into a printing document and well, i couldn't <laughs> Frankly speaking, I couldn't. You see, I'm, I have this thing that when I correspond with my family in Europe, they are not in France, they are in Netherlands. So there is still this four hours gap. So if I want to send something quickly, I have to wait for uh, midnight. Mm, that is bad. We share the same book. Aha, uh -huh. yes. You must have recognized it, no? Yeah. It is a very good edition. But I prefer the first volume. The first volume is a translation of. Um, uh, oh, sorry. No, this is no, not no, no, it is not the, the one. Yeah, it is no, different. yeah, yeah, I have another edition. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes, it is not the same one. So, did uh, Diego? This one will be enough. And. Just one second, I switch it off because mm. uh, oh, yes. So, uh, Sushanji. आप इसे छप छपवा सकेंगे अभी या नहीं ना हो तो कोई बात नहीं लेकिन कम से कम मैंने आपको ये दिया होगा हाँ हाँ सो जस्ट टू रिकैप फ्रॉम द फर्स्ट लेक्चर यू रिमेंबर दोस इम्पोर्टेंट पॉइंट्स दैट आई टोल्ड यू as far as uh, uh, this uh, actually when you study an epics uh, from the point of view of history of literature, I think as far as we know, you know, having information on the, on the life of the author is something very interesting. Because very often, especially from Virgil onwards, personal factors interfere. 
uh, when Virgil does his Aeneid, he uh, obeys a kind of state command. But still, he cannot help putting his own point of view, you know. Izzat ki baat hai. It's a matter of personal pride. Uh, they, uh, an author may be subservient, may be uh, at, the, uh, at the service of the, uh, of the king for writing epics, but he has also this uh, inner demand that I should not only copy the, the ancient writings, no, I should have something of my own. And this happens everywhere, every time. Because after all, a, a poet, an author, he may be paid by the king, but he wants to be singularized as a unique poet. Hmm? So the individual, the biographical factor has some importance. I have written so many, so many things, I'm lost. Uh, so, yes. You have, you see, in, epopeia. Epics. So I say that the person and life of author, it does matter. You see, uh, when uh, Camões writes uh, um, and a long epic poem, in his mind, he has the model of Virgil. When Virgil writes a long epic poem, in his mind, he has the model of Homer. But, of course, Virgil will put his own point of view, and Camões, as we have seen, will also put his own critical point of view. Hmm? So, you have this that somehow contradicts the classical model wanted by the, uh, by the, the power that be, I think, the political power. So, uh, of course, then after you have the uh, oral inspiration, of course. The exaggeration. And the poetic form. Uh, these points are important to remember, but at every stage, the poet, uh, he, of course, tries to give his own um, singularity. So this I wanted to uh, stress on. Yeah. 
Este, bueno, eh, ellos. I'm sorry for that. It is in I made a pixel project. Oh, yes. I, I just can't find it. It's terrible. Yes, no, but I mean to say the thing that I wanted to give you. Yes, I found it. Yes. No, no. Mane, I, I offed it. I, I took off this because. No, because I took off the cable intentionally. Otherwise, my computer does not bear the weight of it okay. see and uh, I cannot so the file I'm giving to you is a very small one but still 36 megabit so that's it now We'll come back to yesterday's business. Um, so these, these are important points. But then after that, we have what I should call from uh, 18th century onwards, a kind of um, modern epics that were not anymore sung, you know, and uh, I would say that wouldn't travel that easily. It is the printed medium that comes first. And that changes many things. Because with the printed medium, you have something called censorship. When uh, in the the French writer Voltaire, 18th century, he was a high, uh, 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 fierce critic of the monarchy and of the church. Uh, so, uh, this must be finished. Yep. So, it, it is Virgil, it starts with Virgil's Aeneid epics and mythology. Hmm? And it is only Ligie. Hmm. And it is only about mythology, but my way. <laughs> All colorful. So when, when Voltaire wanted to write an epics, not only not to please the king, but to not only to please please the uh, the king Louis the Fifteenth um, in France, but also because he would praise himself 
in, of being capable of writing long poetry. Unfortunately, Voltaire's tragedies and epics, that was a flop later on because people were actually waiting for his witty writings and very bad. So Voltaire, he, he failed, he failed. But uh, otherwise, uh, I shall tell you a small poem by Voltaire and you see, he was so, so good at it. Un jour, au fond d'un vallon, un serpent pica Jean Fréron. So, one, uh, one day, in the depth of a uh, gully, hmm? no, a gully, uh, 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 a valley, hmm? a snake <coughs> bites Jean Fréron. Jean Fréron was a very famous Jesuit in Voltaire's time. And Voltaire says, Devinez ce qui arriva. Guess what happened after the Jesuit was bitten by the snake. He says, guess what happened. And then he said, the beast died. <laughs> See? <laughs> in cauda venenum, you remember? Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so he was that uh, good, you know. So it, it is... Uh, uh, ambiguous because the beast could also be the priest. <laughs> so the, the, uh, uh, with this kind of spirit how could he write uh, long epics uh, in, in, in praise of the French king and in praise of the church? That was impossible actually. It was so <clears throat> the uh, so the the personality of the author often clashes with this. Mm. So. Uh, Now you remember we did, um, uh, we commented this. Hmm? Now uh, it is very, very ambiguous. Of course, 19th century publisher, oh, I should uh, enlarge it. As It's terrible because you see this machine reduces my uh, writing as in a very, very tiny shape and it sort of blocks my computer because my computer is not strong enough. Now do we have a case? Nazarata hai? You can see it, yes, in a better way. So, Jean Batel entro, uh, entro u capitan. There is a mistake here. There shouldn't be any D. Uh, u rei que nos braços u levava. Uh, 
uh, you see here, uh, Kamoes, he feels sort of, his duty is not to show the Indian king as a fierce enemy the first time. Because, uh, because he has been fighting those people, he has been talking to them, and he does not want to have a black and white picture. For him, that would not be realistic. Maybe the, the king will not be very pleased, the king of Portugal, to hear that, oh, there are oriental kings. Oh, do they have powerful kings? Yes, they have. Oh, are they, uh, do they have good manners, those savages? Yes, they have, says uh, Camões. Because he's been a long time in Asia, he's been a long time in Africa, so uh, uh, he also tells the king that, look, if your army beats uh, uh, savages, whatever, you know, people who have no law, no, that's too easy. It adds to your prestige to have stronger opponents and noble opponents. Because uh, Camoes was too intelligent to, you know, adhere for, uh, only to the crusader ideology. Because there, were, there was a crusade. You know the crusade, you know what it is. Everybody understand me? Hmm? Salibi Jang, we say. Uh, the the, the so-called reconquest of the Christian by the Christian of the Holy Land of Palestine. And the northern people in Europe, when they wanted to go against the Arab and Berber power that had settled in Iberia for seven centuries, by the way, uh, they thought, oh, they said, oh, they, they, we did fail to recover Jerusalem for a long time, okay. But we are now recovering Iberia from the miscreants, whoever they are. <laughs> forgetting, for, forgetting that, uh, say, 90% of the people in Iberia, they were actually of African origin. They were Berber. To this day, the Berbers, they're just like me. Now, can you say, can you tell I am a, uh, I, 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 I am not a, a, a Berber? No. See? Uh, <laughs> so the, the population of Iberia, from all ways, it had been changing, etc. No matter the religion. That explains how easily the Arab conquest uh, was realized. But the reconquest, like they used to call it, the reconquest was very slow. And it took many, uh, see, from uh, 10th to 14th, to, sorry, to 15th, the very end of 15th century. And even though we have to wait for the French kings in Spain and Portugal to definitely uh, uh, chase, away, chase away to expel uh, the, uh, the converts, to expel the Jews, to expel the Protestants also. <laughs> so they impoverished Spain for always. <laughs> yes. And uh, 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 then the so-called glory and apex, uh, that went to Netherlands. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Camoes was intelligent enough to understand that this uh, uh, so-called reconquest and um, 
uh, Celibi, uh, and crusade ideology because he was a man of renaissance, you know. And for him, that was obscurantism. That was a ridiculous thing with no real uh, fundament. So that's why he he introduced the king of Melinda as not only a powerful king, but someone who has heard about Europe, and that was true, by the way, while the Europeans had never heard about him. So he does. So he... Uh, uh, Jean Nobatel entrou o capitão, o rei que nos seus braços os levava, e com a cortesia que a razão por ser rei requeria, lhe falava, com umas mostras de espanto e admiração, o moro, o gesto e o modo lhe notava, como quem em muito grande estima tinha, gente que de tão longe a Índia vinha. vinha. So, you see, this stanza, I shall translate it in my poor English. Already in the small boat, you remember the picture? Yes. Already in the small boat, uh, entered the captain. The captain is Vasco da Gama. Mm. But he says the ray, the king, the, the Indian king, took him in his, in his arms so that he could board the small boat. Mm. Now look at it. We, he says, with all the courtesy and the uh, uh, and the, mm, the right reason mm. that because he was a king, because he is a king, so he is a courteous man, he is educated. The, the Portuguese, they were not ready to listen to that. Hmm? With comostras uh, of espanto e admiration. But he has to say, well, the Indian king was uh, afraid, but also admir uh, in admiration of the big boat, you know, and the big artillery. Umoru, now, the Portuguese, they would put in the same bag whoever was Muslim, he was a Moru. Morus in Latin, in Latin means having brown hair. Mauritania was the country of people with brown hair. So later on, with this uh, uh, crusade ideology, the Moors, they became the Arabs, they became the Muslims, you know. And uh, uh, when the Portuguese come to Indonesia, where they for example, in some uh, sultanate there, uh, they they don't even listen to the to the speech. They don't look at their custom. Oh, they know the king is a Moor. Uh, the king is a Muslim. Therefore, they are all Muslims, which was totally wrong. Totally wrong. But you know, so he has to use this. Moro. Uh, he says that uh, the Indian king was noticing the way that Vasco da Gama was performing. Hmm? Como quem em muy grande estima tinha gente que de tan longe a vinha. Like somebody who uh, has in great esteem, in great respect, people who come from such far away, so far away to visit India. Mm -hmm. So here you have a picture of an educated man, of a good will, will man who 
receives the Portuguese captain with all courtesy and uh, and uh, what should I say and respect something that would contrast very strongly with other scenes of battles etc but then there's more to it you know he uh, uh, is supposed to be the king of Melinda in India uh, he describes his attire the richness of his attire and with you know with some uh, exact details because he has seen them so now he gives a portrait of the Indian king uh, that is no less than a portrait of a European king so it is a bit ambiguous it says to the Portuguese king and nobility look who is under your scepter who is under your domination now great kings you are the kings of the king the king of the kings all right but in a subliminal I mean to say uh, uh, do you understand me subliminal 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 it means in a second layer of speech hmm? it's a it's a suggestion that is not really written but people understand in uh, in English you have the French uh, phrase double entendre hmm? a double meaning it's a kind of double meaning yes double meaning so uh, this is it uh, so he says well they have those beautiful they 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 are they have gold and silk by those days silk was something almost unknown the Romans they knew silk people knew silk but it, they never knew what it was made about Camões knew so when he says those things people who are uh, dressed with silk etc of course there's the temptation uh, of the the Portuguese nobility oh we want those things also hmm? but uh, inconsciously or not maybe consciously there's the double meaning saying that look those people they know how to make silk they know how to print silk we do not So the the passage of the visit of the rain, uh, the the visit of the king of Melinda to uh, Vasco da Gama is a key passage uh, that one should not expect in an epic poem that is to glorify the you know the, no. Uh, uh, to, to glorify the the great battles the great conquest the bloody conquest hmm? remember on the beginning the first uh, uh, no I yes Sometimes I have to
Is it? Can you read it now? Yes. Is it all right? I know that. I know that. And this is just a, a little recap, and then I go to the other one. So, you remember he has. Oh. In the beginning, he had settled his official plan for his uh, uh, for his epics that he will sing the conquest and then the history of Portugal. But now he goes totally out of it. He goes on presenting a picture of India of India's with an S. Hmm? That is a totally different one. He is no more in the battles, in the glory, etc. So there are inner contradictions, and uh, the poet makes an effort because he has to reconcile himself with what he has seen. He thinks that he should be you know, not only aping Virgil, not only glorifying the bloody empire, which he says here, devastating, you know. So, this is how we should read him. Now, so much for this. I have to come to Uh, to the po the Indo-Portuguese again. Thank you, Sushant Ji. Thank you, sir. Now, if you remember how um, Camões started, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. Camões started saying that I'm going to sing the glorious history of. Portugal, the glorious conquest of Asia by the Portuguese king. Yet, yet, he puts his own point of view. And uh, how many centuries later? Maybe four centuries later, we have this Indian man who is a descendant of converted Indians. Ave Cleto Afonso, who is a retired professor of philosophy in Goa. In 2013, he writes, U vaticinio du swarga. Du. Of. Du. And he also have, in, his, in the beginning of his poem, he have the invocation. Now, in the epics, you always had two things. You had intention, the plan, the exposition. exposition. You had the, the exposition, I'm going to do this and that. I'm going to sing the glories of the history of Portugal. I'm going to sing the glory of the conquest of Asia. That was the exposition. Now, I need inspiration. So there's a compulsory part, stanza rather, that, uh, that is called invocation. So you need to call, Virgil need, uh, needed to call to the goddesses, the muses, the goddesses of Apollo, the goddesses of poetry. Please help me. Please inspire me. 
That is in the tradition. And Camoens does not believe in muses, but still he does. He is calling to the He is calling to the He is calling to uh, the uh, Camoens calls the nymphs, the goddesses of the Tigris rivers. He doesn't believe in it. No, it is only the tradition. Because also he is conscious of his, of his difficulties. So he had so many difficulties. So he says, at least you goddesses of the Tigris, you can help me. Because nobody else did help me. Rather, they used to put me in the jail. <laughs> so, uh, and later on, Afonso, avec les tout Afonso, eh, he also, he has a, uh, he has a prayer, he has a prayer to uh, Ganesh. He has a prayer to Ganesh to help him to write. And he also has uh, a prayer to Sarasvati. No more muses from the, the ocean. But he needs Indian muses. And his Indian muses is Ganesh and Sarasvati. Deus Bondozu dos que com letras e penas ofício fazem Sarvatman prudent and misericordio I translated this in a, uh, yes O Sri Ganesh of blessed name generous God for those who profess the art of writing omniscient, wise, all merciful for those deprived of your grace curved trunk Strong, curved trunk is an allusion to Ganesh trunk. Uh, strong and courageous, son of noble parents whose bravery, words, fear, give me of thy genius, of thy art, nothing more than a small part. And uh, the second one, I'm sorry, I inverted the order. Om Sarasvati Maya, of wisdom and deep of wisdom and deep knowledge, thou art goddess of font and alma. Alma like alma mater means nourishing. You see, you have in English alimentation. Hmm? O font and alma of the sonorous uh, harmony. Sonorous harmony is poetry that this sullen words world so much needs. I stopped here my translation because I was too tired, simply. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, mm. now, this is the one I want as a kind of conclusion. Uh, is this readable? Yes. yes. Now, this is at the end of his preface, because um, I, I read very carefully the whole, he has a long, long introduction in his book, uh, Afonso. For example, in his introduction, he gives a photograph of the last governor of Goa as a war prisoner, shaking hand with the Indian officer on the moment he embarks to uh, Portugal. We are still under fascist regime, by the way. And I told you, I knew those 
days because I was in Portugal also as well as in Spain under Franco and Salazar. I have seen them from far away. I heard them because we had to. Hmm? <laughs> so I know what I'm talking about also. So uh, he shows the last prison, the, the last governor of Goa in uniform. He was a, uh, an army officer, not a navy officer. And his Indian counterpart, they are, they are saying goodbye together to, to each other when he's liberated. And the Indian navy officer is in white. And, you know, for the press, they shake hand. And Afonso has uh, a small legend saying the, the, the final departure. And along to this photograph, he shows a classical image of Vasco da Gama coming to India and meeting the king, just like the image we had before. So he places these two pictures side by side in his book. And so there's, there are two legends, one with Vasco da Gama, the coming, and the second one with the last governor, the departing. And more to it, he, on a map, he draws the voyage of the last uh, Portuguese prisoners going back to Lisbon and compares their sea voyage to the voyage of Vasco da Gama. <laughs> See? That is very clever of his. So he has two maps. One map is the returning um, um, Portuguese Navy uh, ship that is bringing back the last uh, Portuguese prisoners and the last governor back to Lisbon. And they had to have a long voyage because they were not welcome everywhere. Remember, these are the days of Salazar still. Hmm? And uh, it resembles a bit the long voyage that Vasco da Gama had. And in addition, he puts another map with the uh, voyage of Aeneas. <laughs> so, you see, uh, he is a modern man. He cares of illustration. And this is a new thing. Illustration, photograph, pictures, etc. are now uh, more than even 19th century. Because they are, there is now, with modern technology, you have, uh, you know, illustrations in color in a much easier way than before. Much easier. So, Afonso takes the advantage. Hmm? So, let us see what he says here. <coughs> Let this provocation of mine Rustic and poor as it may be, que esta minha provocação, por mais tusca e pobre que seja, va agitar, uh, oh, there's an accent missing here in va, va agitar os espíritos melhormente equipados com imaginação literária e arte da língua. So let this provocation of mine, rustic and poor as it may be, Go and agitate better equipped, equipped minds with literary imagination, imagination and art of writing. He's very modest because he says, oh, well, I made this essay. I leave it to others to write a real epics of Indians fighting the Europeans. I cannot do. All I can do is just tweet some passages of uh, Camões. Hmm?
go and agitate better equipped minds, agitate better equipped minds with literary imagine, imagination and art of writing that may result in other works of greater value and merit, not only to adjust history's pending accounts and erect barriers against, as pos as against any possibility of continuing or repeating old sins. Here he is hitting at what we call neocolonialism. That is uh, not long ago, I think 10 years ago, in France, which is, by the way, a secular um, democracy, uh, some people from the right wings, they proposed a new law saying that, uh, well, we should forget about the bloody war we had in Algeria. And by the way, maybe we were not as culprit, as, you know. This, this, this uh, ambiguous saying that we find also in Portugal that, okay, in Africa, etc., we we did commit great sin. But the opponents, they were bad also, you know. They killed us also. <laughs> so, such an hypocrisy. So the French uh, Assembly, some MPs, they introduced a bill saying that colonialism, of course, it has in inconvenience. All right. But we should uphold the benefits of colonialism. Of course, the law was defeated because there was such a huge cry, such a huge protest. So how can you say, talk of benefit uh, of colonialism in Algeria when they had 300,000 deaths? What is that compared to your own deaths? Hmm? When I was uh, young, in my history book, my history book at school would stop at 1919, <laughs> the end of the First World War. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a picture showing, with some epic poetry as well, showing the beginning of the conquest of Algeria. Guess what was the pretext? Well, the, the Algerian Turkish Pasha, he had took his, you know the fan? With his fan, he had struck at the French ambassador. That was an unbearable provocation and that explains why we needed to have a war. And besides, those Algerians, they were all pirates. You know, they were uh, blocking the trade. And you know, the liberty of trade was also a flag of colonialism. Liberty of trade. And that was true with the Portuguese as well. So you see, with such a, uh, such a pretext, they justify a bloody war that lasted from 1830 to 1890, something like that. And there was no real Pax Romana ever in Algeria. So in Portugal, we also had uh, attempts like that. You very aptly mentioned that it's Salazar who instituted the first stanzas of, NA, uh, of uh, Camões uh, Luciadas, 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 uh, as national anthem. Salazar did even more. He uh, convocated the whole nation by radio on the fall of Goa, Akeda the Goa, and he had a long speech saying that this is not the end of the story. <laughs> but it was. <laughs> but it was. So when uh,
When Cleto speaks of uh, past sins, you know, this is what he alludes to. Because Cleto was very much aware of what was happening in Portugal. And uh, he also must have celebrated the Portuguese Revolution in 1974. Now, who did the Portuguese Revolution in 1974? The colonial soldiers who were fed up for fighting for uh, a uh, totally unjustified empire. Do you know that in Portugal, in the, in the 1960 up to 1974, military service was compulsory four years for everybody above the age of 18. Four years. Because Portugal was not a great population, you know. So they needed people to go to battle. So they, they were so fed up with it that the Portuguese army coming back from Africa, they staged a coup. And even more than that, a few, were, a few months later, in the whole of Portugal, you had autonomous communities who declared that uh, the, 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 uh, I mean, to, to the hell, hell with, the, uh, with fascism. Uh, we want to, buy, to ban all these things. Uh, so that happened 10 years, more or less, 10 years after the fall of Goa. And uh, uh, when uh, uh, Cleto says, continuing or repeating old sins, he's hitting as a rightist reaction in Portugal that followed after the 1974 coup, they had, you know, a rightist government also that came back. Not a fascist one, that was impossible. Thank God, I should say. But he's hitting at it. So saying that, no, uh, the, the cultural fight is never lost, never lost. We have to carry on. He says, yes, Portuguese is part of my culture. Yes, you know, 400 years is something. Yes, but my way, but our own way, you see, he says, let this provocation of mine, rustic and poor, poor is, sorry, this is a big mistake, poor, P-O-W-E-R. <laughs> it's a typing mistake. Uh, poor as it may be, go and agitate, uh, no, I can't. Go and agitate better equipped minds with literary imagination and art of writing that may result in other works of greater value and merit, not only to adjust history's pending accounts. So what he calls history's pending accounts is when, as I told you, when he puts two pictures side by side of the last governor leaving and the first so-called governor coming. Vasco da Gama and the last Portuguese governor, whose name I forgot. Oh, I knew his daughter. Yes, in Lisbon, his daughter, she became a shop owner. <laughs> and once I entered the shop, and uh, because I had, here I hear, heard about her, and I did ask her <laughs> about her father. She was not very proud of it. but also in order to enrich our cultures and open new, new frontiers for the coming generation. You know, erect barriers against any possibility of continuing or repeating old sins, but also in order to enrich our cultures 
and open new frontiers for the coming generation. He says that power, the power of poetry is still very strong, still very strong, whether it is written or sung anyway. The power of poetry is there. The power of literature is there. Let us always remember that only dialogues between literatures are capable of transforming common friendships between nations into major encounters of civilizations. You see, this is a very important point. By, by the way, the capital is not mine. Huh? It is there and there as well. Long live truth, always. Satya, uh, Satya Nev, uh, Satya Nev Jai, 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 Jai Satya. Goa, India, July 30, 2013, avec les trois Strange. The last words are in English. <laughs> so, and this is his signature which I just photographed, and the same, you know. So, he uh, says in other parts of his preface, there is a whole pleading for the recognition of, uh, uh, of Goen's mother, mother tongue, that is uh, Canada. No. Konkani. Yeah. At that time, Marathi Konkani was what Marathi was considered. Yes. And the last governor was Manuel da Silva. Yes, yes, yes. But you see, uh, uh, he says, yes, Manuel da Silva. <laughs> Very ironical, you see. Manuel means, Emmanuel in Hebrew means sent by God. And Da Silva is a very, very common Portuguese name. <laughs> every, every Portuguese out of two is a Da Silva. <laughs> yes, it means from the forest. <laughs> Silva is forest. Yes, there is a whole code. Yes, there is a whole code that dates back to 17th century. Not 16th, because 17th century they did. They, they settle it. They settle it. They settle it. So, uh, the. He has uh, a plea for Konkani. Now, uh, in Portuguese day, the, uh, days, they were confused between Canara and Konkani. And they used to call the Indians from Goa areas, they used to call them Canaries. Canarese. So, for a long, long time, Yes. Yes. And and yes and 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 Clay to uh, Afonso he pleads for developing Konkani literature. He says, okay, we will not drop. Um, Portuguese, well, let people who are better than me do it, all right, okay. But we should not drop Konkani, we should develop Konkani. And this is what is happening now. Uh, at the beginning of month of January, I was in BHU with you, 
and I attended uh, a small seminar where we had uh, Konkani speakers with Portuguese name or, or with Indian name, no, no matter, but Konkani speakers who were developing uh, critical studies of translation of French literature into Konkani and translation of Portuguese literature into Konkani, the Indian way. And this, uh, you see, we are far from the classical models, etc. We do not forget about them. No, we do not forget. But we have to be up to today's needs and techniques. That's why uh, Cleto has such a colorful uh, representation in the uh, come on. See. The Swarga. So he puts it in the first cover of his book. That is a kind of manifesto, a dual one, I would say. First of all, saying that poetry, etc., that is all right. But the art of picture, the art of illustrating, is now as important. Pictures are a mean to translate. Picture is also a kind of translation. And his work is adaptation of uh, some parts of Camões. So he says adaptation, if it has to be successful, we should have pictures. And colored pictures and sort of, you see, this is a, I would say, a pedagogical picture. At the end of his book, he has, uh, I did not have time to show it uh, because I could not re retrieve my photograph. Before coming to India, I spent two or three days hastily making photographs of my old books. I opened my Lusiadas, which I bought in March 1964. You heard? 1964. I had opened it very often, but I did not read much because for me it was taken for granted. You know, I, 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 in my career I quoted many colonial chroniclers of uh, India compared to Persian chroniclers. By the way, they did knew, know each other. There was a school of translation in <coughs> Lisbon where they had not one, but many Indian uh, and Arab uh, translators working. This is why the Portuguese fonts are very, very interesting. They are biased, all right, but who is not? In history, you have to choose your camp. So, uh, comparing these writings was uh, essential for me. I do not know Persian well, but thanks to Urdu, that translates very much, very close to or the original, I can read. I can, I know what it is there. Arabic is much more difficult for me. I, Arabic, I can just use the dictionaries. Arabic, Arabic, I can use the dictionary. But <laughs> further, no. But Persian, I can appreciate the text because of the Urdu text and because of the Portuguese contemporaneous text. They, sometimes you find a Portuguese a chronicler, he has three or four pages literally quoting an Indian chronicle that has disappeared. And this is very useful. And he says, they say, oh, the Indian chronicler says this and that. I say this and that. Hmm? So uh, the uh, 
I say that the, uh, our work now is to look at those texts, to criticize them, whether it is uh, epics, because epics, as you remember, epics is also history. Hmm? There is no no epics without history. There is no official propaganda without history. It's everywhere, everywhere. So the, it is a duty of historians. I, I place myself as a historian of literature, but still doing history, because without history, um, I would say I'm powerless. And of course, knowledge of languages is basic. So if you have to retrace the whole uh, succession of epics, whether it is here or there, you find key moments of rewriting, of printing, of illustrating, of adaptating. You see, these are uh, uh, key moments of the history of literature. Translating, recomposing, adapting, which is not really translating. Of very often there comes a point where you cannot anymore translate because your translation is not readable if you want to be read. I'm not talking of scientific translation. That is another thing. I could write, if I took time, I could write a good scientific translation of, say, uh, Camoy's poems, which I know quite well. Well, it, if it is in English, it will take me time. If it is in French, it will also take me time because my literary French is far from perfect. I'm not a writer. But then uh, I can supplement my translation of Lusiadas with notes, like you've seen them hmm, in the Latin text. I have to supply notes and even a glossary so that people can understand the classical text. Because now, uh, Lusiadas is a classical text. Above that, if I want to give a reading to, say, young people, I cannot do that anymore. I have to make it shorter. I have to put pictures, I have to maybe write easy poetry, you know. So uh, on one side you have the scientific effort of uh, translating, criticizing, editing epics, keeping in mind all these points, you know the life of the author, the classical model, the uh, oral inspiration that later came to written, uh, the exaggeration, the poetic form, etc., etc. Also something that you have when you are looking at those texts, also something that is a must now if you have to commend them, is archaisms. Now, uh, in, um, in Camões, we do have words and locutions and phrases that were not anymore fashionable in his time. He did that on purpose. He did that on purpose. One of his uh, intentions was to say, A, hey, I am from Galicia, remember? What is now northern Spain. 
So my ancestor's speech is not like the king's speech. So I'll put some of it. And in addition, to give a kind of, you know, respectability to his modern poetry, 1571. He puts many, uh, many, yes, quite many forms of Portuguese that were not used in his time anymore. The printers, they were at Ross. And, you know, uh, this is a catastrophe. The first two printers, when, and there was one print first in 1572, and the second one the same year, because the printer, by the way, he was of French origin, printing industry came from France and Portugal, Galliardo, Gaillard, huh? Galliardo. Uh, Gaillard, Gaillard means a strong man. Guy, Gaillard. So he was at a loss. And errors were so many, printing errors. So they said, oh no, we must have a second print. And they had a second print, and then uh, Camões intervened. He said, no, I want this and this and that. But in, in those days, censorship, the court, the printer, because the printer was also a publisher. They had their say. And uh, it was very difficult for Camões to get his own uh, work printed to the extent of it that some people, after his death, they got hold of the manuscripts and they made supposedly better versions in Spanish <laughs> under the Spanish king that had become the king of Portugal. Much to uh, the deception of the soul of Camões, who was dead by the way. So, you see, uh, epics, they do have this to this day, I mean, even 17th century epics or 16th century epics, that it was difficult to fix them. The authors themselves, they would say, oh, my language is not today's language exactly because I am inspired by Virgil, I am inspired by Homer, so I cannot speak like you do now. I have to introduce this and that. And then the, the publishers would say, oh no, but these are errors. And that has made modern publishing of Camois very difficult and very late. And there is also another thing. Epics, they became classics and part of teaching subjects. Hmm? Now you have a problem. You cannot teach 10,000 verses to 16-year or 14-year or 13-year children. They will run away. <laughs> you cannot. It's impossible. In my youth, I remember, theoretically, we had to learn once a week 100 Latin verses from Virgil. I never succeeded. And we never succeeded, actually. That was all in the imagination of the teacher. <laughs> we, we couldn't, th that was not possible, because we had to do mathematics, we had to do history, we had, you know. So the, uh, the professor, Latin professor, he had to compromise. Hmm? So uh, now the approach to epics at schools, it is uh, very delicate. Say, in 1964, when I bought my Camoens in Portugal, by the way, there was a long preface for the students. It was a, a recommendation to the teachers also. 
that such and such and such passages are to be taught. Others are not to be taught. <laughs> you see, the selection of it was already completely distorting the, the work. And that was true in France of Virgil also. And when uh, I was very fortunate because when I started studying Portuguese, I was, I think I was 12 years old, uh, Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, we, Spanish was compulsory with Latin, and then our, uh, um, our college principal, he was a very enlightened man. He said, in my college, I want as many languages as possible. People say, that, yeah, th this is not realistic. He said, yes, we have so many Portuguese refugees from the fascist regime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have so many uh, refugees from USSR. I want Russian to be taught in an ordinary small town college. I want Russian to be taught. I want Greek to be taught because in his mind that would go side by side with Russian. I want Portuguese to be taught. But then they said, well, we have no grammar of Portuguese in French. And one of the professors, uh, I knew him well, uh, Cantel, his name was Cantel, he was a very small man, professor at the French uh, at the University of Poitiers, my hometown, he said, okay, I'm a good philologist. I, well, I shall write a Portuguese grammar for the college. And that was the first ever Portuguese grammar written in French. Uh, and one of the first modern grammar of Portuguese ever written, ever written. Because, see, it was not during the fascist regime. There were things that you could not say, could not print, even in grammar. Yes. So I was fortunate enough to be able to read Camões with the help of a Portuguese lecturer. He was not, uh, at, actually, he, he was not at all a teacher. He was a refugee, political refugee a poet, Arlindo de Carvalho. He was my professor, first ever. Refugee. Yes, he was refugee in my little college in Paris, in, in Poitiers. Just imagine, he, uh, he was persecuted. And he said, well, I have to teach you Portuguese, but I don't know how to teach Portuguese. So let us sing, let us sing. And we learned, we were singing <laughs> his, his own poetry, and this is how we learned. Because it was close to Spanish also, so it was not very difficult for us. And then he said, well, now dictation. And he dictated his poems. So we wrote the poems. Ooh. Yes. You know, his. Uh, Mm. His poem that uh, Aves de Azas Quebradas, hmm? that was the first one I learned. Uh, he is referring to the boats of the Portuguese uh, fishermen who had to go on exile in order not to fight for the Portuguese Empire. And their boats are staying there like birds with broken wings. Hmm? So that was my, the first poem I ever learned. And I was happy enough to learn Portuguese with someone who was a political refugee and a poet. And this is, uh, uh, this is something I hardly told anybody, by the way. So you are lucky, <laughs> I'm telling you. I was 
Yes, I was, uh, uh, I was 10 years old. And Arlindo was a fantastic man. By those days, we did not even know who he was. And then somebody brought a record of his. Huh? <laughs> we used to nickname him Carnaval Rio. <laughs> Rio Carnaval, you know? Uh, the carnival in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So, so we were uh, so fascinated by the music and, and the, the <laughs> we didn't have any other reference anyway. So that's it. Now uh, I want questions from you. Yeah. So no questions. Yesterday we were discussing. Some people have promised that they will have questions today. Whatever we have done in the last few days. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, in, in, in that emergence, there, there was a kind of uh, apprehension of censorship. Yes. Like, of a possibility of censorship. Yes, yes. I could understand that. You see, it is very difficult to censor a song that goes on. Okay. Hmm. It, it's a form of, of protest. Hmm. Even if it is classical poetry, it can become a form of protest. So you cannot stop it. You cannot stop it. But if it is written, mm. censorship is there. You can ban the book. You can cut out the book. Mm -hmm. hmm? Yes. Arlindo de Cavalio did show me some of his poems that were barred by the censorship. So censorship uh, comes along with printing. Mm -hmm. Because the king or the power, they had what used to be called privilege. If you were a writer, you would plead from the king's ministers and from the church. Uh, I would like to publish this. Will you give me the privilege? of getting it publishing and so far and I would get the money from the from selling the books mm -hmm. and of course in Portugal uh, the Inquisition was still alive and very strong you have to wait for 1778 after the uh, earthquake of Lisbon 1778 is when a minister the first minister of the king says, oh, we will stop the church's work. We don't want church's interference. We don't want the Jesuits anymore. Hmm? So the, uh, there is a break. Mm -hmm. Then after, you see, that, that was because of with what we call the Century of the Lights, the Enlightenment. Hmm? Yeah. But it didn't last much. Actually, the censorship in Portugal and Inquisition, Inquisition lasted up to the coming of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. Napoleon must have been a bloody conqueror, etc. But thanks to his coming, uh, Inquisition was officially abolished. But come to think of it, 1535-1812 of persecution. Yes, yes. And even before it would exist, but in, uh, in Portugal, because of the very important minority of converts, 
it couldn't come into force uh, easily, you know. So, printing means censorship for, for a long time. For a long time. Huh? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. And you, you stay, studied Almeida Garrett. No, you, you must have read Auto da Fe. Okay. So any other questions? Any other remarks? Please. From the island, we are waiting for something. Very much. Sir, uh, the rules of MRC just in Goa. Is there any possibility that he has been printed <coughs> Indian text, and that has been that has has had an impact on his? Uh, on the beginning, no, because he, uh, on the beginning, no. But in later years, yes, because he knew Arabic. He could read Arabic, and he learned, like all Portuguese uh, important captains, you know, they knew a kind of mixture of Persian and Arabic. And through that, they had some inklings. Now, the church in Goa was uh, very early, very, very early, produced text, Christian text, in Konkani and, in, uh, uh, and also in Persian. There was a school in Goa that was called St. Paul's. St. Paul's, uh, St. Paul, like São Paulo in Brazil, St. Paul is the preferred saint of the Jesuits company. So uh, they, they had a school of interpreters, very early, in St. Paul's College in Goa. And through that, Camoens must have had some inklings, you know, not much, but some of it, some of it. And we see it in his, uh, uh, Luziadash, because before writing his Luziadash, he had also read chroniclers who wrote before him. And those chroniclers, they had translated from, uh, say, perhaps Sanskrit also, and Persian. That were their main sources. So through them, he had sort of hearsay very, very little. But he was, he was not totally ignorant of those, you know, he was not totally ignorant. Otherwise, his main influence when he's in Goa, when he writes poetry, it is Italian. But not Italian of the church, Italian of the philosophers, Italian of Dante, of the poets. Not, uh, <laughs> you see, he, uh, perhaps, perhaps we can trace uh, some legends in, in Lusiadas, some Indian legends, allusions, allusions. Hmm. And also he had a knowledge of the Latin knowledge about India. This is it. Anybody else? Please. Yes, please. I, it is difficult, you see, because the classical label is something that kept on changing. Hmm? In, uh, in Camões times, classical was Latin and Greek. Uh, 
Portuguese was hardly worth mentioning. And Camoens had to fight to say, no, no, I'm not writing in Spanish, I'm writing in Portuguese. Hmm? Uh, later on in the 19th century, there was a nationalistic trend in the whole of Europe that, uh, that uh, wanted to see the first written text in every national language. That was a very, very tricky thing. What, what are the beginning? I mean, if I take so-called old French, in ninth century, one word out of two is German, and the third one is Latin. And they called that old French. So there was a dispute, you know, <laughs> just because that started in Strasbourg, which used to be a disputed area between the Germans and the French for a long, long time. So you would locate old French there. And now, what should we call classical? Now, as far as French language was concerned, they have chosen the apex, the maximum height of the French monarchy that is mid, mid 17th century, with the reign of Louis, of Louis XIV, who was a great admirer of Latin uh, literature. So there was something called the French Academy that was instituted as a imitation of the Greek Academia, hmm, which was something different, but well. And, and then the French Academy was able to say, well, now, later on, we will consider as classic French terms the Louis the Fourteenth epoch, you know, mid sixteenth, mid mid seventeenth century. So, in almost every country, you have a definition of classics, and people tend to adequate the notion of classical literature with a supposedly glorious period of your country. And there is, and it keeps on changing, of course. Because languages, they do change. And power, <coughs> governments, they do change. So the idea of classicism is very practical if you say, oh, a classic is something that is told, that is uh, uh, taught in classes. <laughs> so this is a, a very uh, sort of hypocrisy, <laughs> hypocrite definition, a practical one, say. Hmm? But if you scratch a bit, underneath there are other ideas. Hmm? So classic is something that keeps on changing, and from one nation to another, they have a different notion of which time, which text, which authors are supposed to be classic. The Belgium, Belgium is a country, as you know, hmm? they are very close to us, very close. They have a majority of French speaking, and others, they have uh, uh, Flemish, uh, speaking. But, you see, uh, they had a political problem when they wanted, uh, some people wanted to separate Flemish speaking land and going to Netherlands. But the Netherlands people said no, because your kind of Flemish is not ours. We don't want you. And also, the Flemish people said, well, if we want to be independent, well, where are our classics? Unfortunately, they are now in Netherlands. So, 
And but we have the French classics. Oh, but we do not speak French. So we need the French population to have classics of our own. So Belgium has, you know, a kind of compromises with classics in Netherlands and in the uh, Netherlands speech in Flemish and in French as well. And they have chosen poets who are of Flemish origin but used to write in French as their favorite poems, poets. You see, classics is also a political necessity, just as much as epics. No, maybe somebody else, perhaps. Yes? Uh, Sorry. I want to ask that, so, um, I know Omar Elias as a famous artist in the world. And if I'm not mistaken, you explain he left it to India. And I think like India also has, has some famous artists. But in the other hand, in Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia, yes. actually, I... I know that. Yes, I do know some, there are some epics, yes. but it's not famous epics. So my question is, uh, as uh, a narrative or poem can be famous epic, should have their influence from the colonialism or what another aspect should be the world literature? Uh, have you ever visited Singapore? Never. Never. I visited Singapore twice for every time more than one week. The second time there was a huge ex exhibition in Singapore National Museum showing the Ramayana from Indonesia with pictures. And you see the wall behind you? Look at the wall behind you, please. Hmm? The height and you multiply this wall by, in length by 20. And you have an idea of the role they brought from Indonesia for exhibition. It was a huge roll painted and it would take a full ale of the museum to be exhibited. Even they could not finish. They had to roll part of it. Hmm? And that was fully colored like this, you know, images. I'm not tall enough. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Huh? With the text. But texts were a just minor thing. What would matter is the picture, which is a good way of teaching as well. So, this is how, came, how I came to know about Ramayan in Indonesia. Yes, actually, Kakawi, it's like Kakawi, but I would know the one hand of Kakawi. That's also the famous epic from Indonesia because it has related to Indian yes. culture. Yes, uh, you see, uh, in Dutch time in Indonesia, that was suppressed. Mm -hmm. That was suppressed because it would mean a uh, want of independence, simply. Hmm? I have seen also exhibitions in Amsterdam, where my family is now, um, of uh, um, Indonesian classics linked with the revolution movement. There was an exhibition about that. But it took Ten years before the die-hard uh, Hollandese, um, I mean Netherlands people, you know, they still had die-hard colonialists, people who were from the former police in Indonesia, they did not want to hear about it. And they fought with the museum authorities saying, no, no, having an exhibition on the independence of Indonesia, no, for God's sake. They have killed so many people of ours. 
No. But then the museum was stronger and they had that exhibition. Hello. Yeah, hello. So uh, that exhibition lasted for quite a long time and uh, I visited it. It was mostly in Dutch with some English, you know, subtitles somewhere. But I needed no translation, of course. So, you see, uh, classics were brought there. And there was, uh, like Cleto Afonso says, there was a strong uh, uh, opposition within Netherlands not to show the Indonesian Revolution. And I'm talking of three years ago. Yes, of course. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, Amir Hamza, the Amir Hamza stories uh, have been rewritten and enlarged in Urdu. And uh, it's a beautiful text, Amir Hamza. It's long, but is it an epic? It is an epic, of course. Because you have all his uh, deeds and you have magics into it. That was partly retaken by uh, um, uh, the, what, what, what were you, uh, well, by an Indian writer. But anyway, that is translated into English also. It is, if, I'm, if memory doesn't fail me, 700 page book, okay. bigger than this, you know? yeah. multiplied by three. And it is epics because Amir Hamza is the main hero, supposed to be a cousin of the prophet. Of course, he is never mentioned anywhere in the Quran, but he is a hero. And actually, it is a rewriting of Iranian epics. First in Persian and then in Urdu. And the Urdu, believe me, because I read it very well, is not inferior to any epics I know. And you have great battles, you have magics, you have prediction. And thank God we have an author now. Uh, I just forgot it. Because that is disputed also. Hmm? Like uh, so many epics. 19th century, 19th century. Thanks, I'm still there. Oh yes, it's 11.20. Sir? <coughs> yes, yes, I know, I know that. Hmm. Ah, so, just forgot about... Now this time. is just uh, right. uh, Thanksgiving. We are grateful, sir, that you have taken out time. And uh, <coughs> you can see that you have interacted well. And the, a few traditions, as we say, we should know the epic traditions, its political dimensions what is classical, what is classics, the political dimensions of that, and that in the context of world literature. That's what we have been discussing in all these days. So now I think we are much more enriched with the intervention of uh, all the um, aspects of epic from various traditions, from various texts, and how it, the tradition continues even in 20th century in different ways and its political and cultural implications that we have been discussing. So we are grateful, sir for your time and for your patience 
and for your kindness to talk so politely. I know you are a very polite person. <laughs> that is the uh, sign of a very scholarly person as well. <clears throat> so we are grateful, sir. I, we it's thank you important. from the part of all our uh, institution from, uh, and from all our school uh, scholars and from all the teachers and from the department. And you, you shall sir. get my writings <laughs> later on because I'm committed to send to Sushant, you know, transforming my PPP into printable text. <laughs>